My name is Sarah Martin, and I'm from the Center for Effective Philanthropy. Thank you for joining us at the kickoff event of CEP's 20th anniversary virtual learning series. We'd like to thank the generous sponsors of our virtual learning series. Our premier sponsor, the Walton Family Foundation, our distinguished sponsor, the Artstone Foundation, and our sponsors, New Hampshire Charitable Foundation, Jacob and Valeria Langeloth Foundation, and the Elmina B. Sewell Foundation. Welcome everyone to the Center for Effective Philanthropy's 20th anniversary learning sessions. I'm Phil Buchanan, president of CEP, and for two decades we've sought to help foundations and increasingly individual donors to improve their effectiveness and increase their impact. We do this through assessments and research reports that often lift up the perspectives of those who wouldn't otherwise be heard, as well as programming like this. We're a nonprofit. We rely on grants and contributions to support our research. So thanks if you're supporting us, and please reach out if you'd like to. Our event today kicks off a series of three major virtual events we'll hold this year in place of our in-person conference. In addition, we'll have a number of other webinars throughout the year highlighting our research and its implications for individual donors as well as foundations. Today, you're joining well over 1,000 others to have this important discussion and hear about philanthropy's role in supporting racial equity. Our belief at CEP is that in this country anyway, whether you're a foundation or an individual donor, you can't really be effective, no matter your philanthropic goals, without engaging deeply with questions related to systemic racism. Because racism and race, racist policies have infected every area, from the environment to education to healthcare, producing staggeringly disparate outcomes. It's incumbent on every giver to think about their role in countering inequity and creating a society in which your race or where you're born predicts nothing about your life. To take us into that conversation about what it would take to get there, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Grace Nicolette. She's CEP's Vice President for Programming and External Relations and also co-host with me of a podcast called Giving Done Right, who is our host and moderator today. Thanks again for joining us. We are here today to discuss a vital topic, taking stock of where philanthropy is in its support of racial equity in the United States. With the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor in 2020, and many others at the hands of law enforcement, there was a widespread collective lament anger, and a public reckoning over the unequal treatment of black lives. Of course, the struggle for racial equity in this land goes back centuries, even before our founding. And as we reckon with that history, both individually and collectively, we know that race continues to be a dominant determining factor in the destiny and trajectory of millions of people of color in the United States today. Which brings us to today's discussion. What is philanthropy's role in the work of racial justice? Has there been a shift in philanthropic practices to reflect last year's public reckoning and the fact that many communities of color are disproportionately impacted by the pandemic? From CEP's research, we know the answer is yes. Many foundations have indeed stepped up their support during this time. But we also know that these changes may not be sustained and that foundation boards and staffs remain overwhelmingly white. So what are the gaps in philanthropy's support of racial equity? What must be done for philanthropy to be a powerful force in dismantling racist structures, policies, and practices? Before we dive into this conversation with our panel today, we've invited a very special artist to perform a table setting piece for what will follow. Micah Borne is a poet, musician, teacher, and activist based in Long Beach, California. His poetry speaks with tremendous strength and compassion around what it means to be black in America today and the eyes of an artist to see our past and imagine what hope might look like for our future. What up everybody, it's Micah Borne. I'm a poet and musician coming at you from my home in Long Beach, California. Uh, I wanna apologize in advance if you happen to hear any screaming, laughing, or crying children. Uh, we are living in strange times. Um, but I'm excited to be a part of CEP's 20th 
anniversary virtual learning session. And I'm going to be sharing a few poems and a few thoughts with you today. Um, it's good to be in conversation with people who care about marginalized folks, about those on the fringes of society, about oppressed people. Um, as a Black American, as a descendant of slaves on both sides of my family, I am overwhelmed with gratitude when I think about how far we've come as a society. But at the same time, I'm often deeply discouraged when I think about how far we still have to go. When I think about the changes in laws, in hearts, in culture uh, that we still need to have a just and fair and equal society, it it can feel overwhelming. It can feel like insurmountable odds at times. But I really get encouraged when I consider the artists and the activists who came before me um, all throughout history in many different contexts, all the way back to someone like da Vinci, for example, who lived in the late 1400s, early 1500s. And if you look into his notebooks, you saw these sketches of what he called flying machines. <laughs> he had to be the laughing stock of his contemporaries. Everyone knows humans cannot fly, we don't have wings, and yet 400 years later, the Wright brothers took off on the first flight. Something a little closer to our context, Dr. Martin Luther King is such a staple in communities who care about justice, I think sometimes we get so familiar with his name and his legacy that we don't realize just how absurd his dream was. Not his method, which obviously a lot of people disagreed with, but his dream itself was crazy when you consider the context. I mean, you had the president of the United States having to send a military escort to accompany a little black girl to school because grown adults were prepared to pour out the fullness of their hatred and wrath upon a child. You had college students risking their lives getting spit on and beat because they wanted to order a cheeseburger at a white-owned restaurant. You had grown men, black men, abducted and lynched in broad daylight by angry mobs for the crime of existing. And it was that context in which Dr. King came along and he had this vision of little black kids and little white kids holding hands, running around, playing on the playground while their parents chatted on a park bench. This is fantasy. This is absurd. They hate us. They want to kill us. They want to kill you. This dream is nuts. And yet, him and many others, fully aware of the truth of that hatred, they still saw what they saw. And the willingness to look at what seemed to be insurmountable odds and push forward anyway. The willingness to be seen as a fool is exactly what we need. That's the type of courage and faith that moves nations and societies forward and toward the world that we want to live in. So this first poem is titled, Humming Fools. We are proud to be storytellers, but there was a time when we were considered fools, when only birds could fly and the earth was flat, when hip hop and jazz were not considered music, when black and brown were not considered human, when humans could not walk on the moon, when pictures could not move, when women could not vote, when we could not share a meal unless we shared a skin tone. Yes, we were there way back then. 
being mocked and dismissed by most. But we never were ashamed. We never stayed quiet. We were there, telling stories of a day when impossible things would be daily routines. Today's common sense was yesterday's absurdity, yet here we are, flying on airplanes, walking on moons, watching moving pictures in multiple dimensions, voting for women, listening to MCs flow rivers of words over jazz beats, having meals and children with lovers from other cultures. Yes, here we are, today, still considered fools being mocked and dismissed by most. But we never are ashamed. We never stay quiet. Here we are, telling stories of a day when impossible things will be daily routines. Today's absurdity will be tomorrow's common sense and we'll be there with more stories to be told, more voices to be heard, more nevers becoming every days. We'll be there. When creative things are not considered electives, but core to the education of human beings. When developing your creativity is a responsible thing, and working a passionless job to get rich is a silly dream. We'll be there when art is taken down from its ivory tower, consumed less like caviar and more like bread and water. We'll be there. When artists are not starving, when humans are not starving, when being white is not a privilege and being black is not a curse, when we love Mother Earth like a mother instead of only taking from her, we'll be there. When our fantasies become common sense, and even then we will speak of impossible things, the only hope we have are the stories we tell. Stories not bound by what is possible, by what is dead. We walk on water, we resurrect. They laughed us to death, but here we are. Humming fools, unashamed of hope. Our stories are future. Our stories are foolish. Only until tomorrow. As I said, deeply grateful for the progress we've made and how far we've come, but also very aware of the amount of work that still needs to be done. A few years ago, when Barack Obama was still the president, there was an announcement made that Harriet Tubman was going to replace Andrew Jackson on the face of the $20 bill. Uh, when that happened, I remember there was a lot of joy in the black community. And I recall getting on social media and seeing my friends post statuses like, I can't wait to go to the bank. Like, let me get $300 all Tubman's, please. Tubman's only, yes, yes. And uh, it was really funny. And I was laughing with my community. Um, but if I'm being honest, the news hit me as bittersweet and really more bitter than sweet. To me, it seemed like a strange way to honor a woman like her. And I couldn't quite put my finger on why, but it just didn't rub me the right way. And then I came across this article about the city of Boston and everything clicked. I was like, oh, this is why I can't really celebrate in the way I wish I could. So this poem is from my book of poetry titled Here Comes This Dreamer. And the poem is titled Lament. For Mother Tubman. The median net worth for non immigrant African American households in the greater Boston region is $8. The household median net worth was $247,500. For whites, the color of wealth in Boston, 
a 2015 report by the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, Duke University, and the New School. America promises to print Harriet Tubman on a $20 bill. A cruel and unusual honor. Give Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but keep my mama out your filthy palms. Remember all the nothing that changed when this nation literally tokenized Sacagawea in fake gold? Remember how indigenous people still live in squalor? You can't blackface a dollar and call it reparations. Newly bred Tubmans crammed into privileged wallets, sardined in bank vaults like the hulls of slave ships. Businessmen pass a pimp a stack of Harriets to rape a teenage sex slave with African hips, while Mother Tubman's daughters and sons struggle to keep the heat on. In Boston, a black father dies after decades of wanting to. New England's bitterness finally froze his will to hope. He left his family a modest inheritance, a suicide note apology, eight dollars, and a special edition Celtics jersey. In Boston, a black mother dies after decades of refusing to. After freedom marches and protest, after cancer stole both breasts, after spending her savings on saving herself, she leaves her daughter a closet full of church hats, an award-winning cornbread recipe, and a family Bible with $8 hidden in Philippians 4.19, my God will supply every need. America really believes they doing us a favor. Painting our faces on their dreams, writing in God we trust on this blasphemous economy, assigning net worth to human beings. Life ought to be priceless, but only the breath of the highly appraised gets protected. No wonder this nation considered us more useful as slaves. Capitalism ascribes an $8 value to free black lives. If Mother Tubman was alive today, she would need two and a half selves before she was worth the weight of her very own bill. I want to thank y'all for listening. I hope you appreciated the poetry. I hope you were challenged. But most of all, I hope... You keep hoping, keep dreaming, keep fighting evil with poetry. Well, it's hard to follow such powerful words from Micah Borne, but we'll do our best. Welcome to the live discussion portion of our program. As a reminder to our attendees, we've created a discussion guide where you can jot down your notes and reflections from today's event. The link to it was shared in the chat box. And we encourage you to use the guide to um, individually or with others in your organization. You can also follow along and join the discussion with the Twitter hashtag CP2021. I invite you to enter your questions in the Q&A box at any time, and we'll try to get to as many as possible in the second half of our discussion today. I'd like to invite the panelists to join us now, and I'll introduce them one by one. First, Yolanda Quentro is the president and CEO of the Institute for Nonprofit Practice, working to transform the nonprofit sector to make it exponentially more effective, equitable, diverse, and connected. Under her leadership, INP is scaling its award-winning leadership development programs nationally and deepening programmatic impact for a nonprofit student body that is majority BIPOC and women. Next, Trisha Rakes is the co-founder of the Rakes Foundation with her husband, Jeff. Based in Seattle, the foundation works towards a just and inclusive society where all young people have the support they need to reach their full potential. The foundation also works to increase the effectiveness of philanthropic giving through its impact-driven philanthropy initiative. And Trisha also serves on numerous boards nationally. We're also glad to have with us Rashad Robinson, President of Color of Change, the largest racial justice organization in the US with more than 7 million members who are building power for black communities. Color of Change uses innovative strategies to bring about system change in the industries that affect black people's lives. Silicon Valley, Wall Street, Hollywood, Washington, corporate boardrooms, local prosecutor offices, state capitol buildings and city halls around the country. 
Last but not least, we have Darren Walker, president of the Ford Foundation, a $14 billion interna international social justice philanthropy. Under his leadership, the Ford Foundation became the first nonprofit in US history to issue a $1 billion designated social bond in the US capital markets for proceeds to strengthen and stabilize nonprofits in the wake of COVID-19. His latest book is called From Generosity to Justice, A New Gospel of Wealth. We have over 1,200 folks joining us in the webinar today, many of whom are from nonprofit backgrounds, as well as many folks who are major donors or work at foundations. I want to center our discussion today on philanthropy's role in supporting racial equity. As I mentioned in the video intro, last month CEP released a series of reports on how foundations are responding to crisis. And the second report in that series found that foundations have indeed shifted their funding priorities to focus on racial justice but the results are uneven and may not last. And so I wanted to dive into our discussion today by starting with Darren. Um, Darren, under your leadership, the Ford Foundation has committed to challenging inequality, broadly speaking, with racial justice being a key pillar of the work. I'm wondering, what do you see as the state of things in the field of philanthropy with regards to racial justice after the year that we had last year, 2020? Well, thank you. Uh, Grace very much and I'm really honored to be here with these three remarkable peers who I learn from every day by watching their leadership and grateful to CEP, you and Phil for all you do to help um, the sector. I think we in my 20 plus years uh, in philanthropy have made progress. There is no doubt that when I joined the Rockefeller Foundation in 2000, we did not talk about racial justice. We certainly never mentioned the words white supremacy. And we absolutely did not talk about power because those are the core root challenges in a democracy, in a democracy that wishes to be multiracial. And what we in philanthropy have to do, I believe, is to help us succeed in that aspiration to be a successful multiracial democracy. And if we are to do that, philanthropy has to do what Dr. King said we needed to do when he said the following, philanthropy is commendable, but it should not allow the philanthropist to overlook the economic injustice, which makes philanthropy necessary. So that's a very different idea than Carnegie and Rockefeller's ideas of generosity and charity. What Dr. King challenged us to do was to seek dignity and justice. And that requires the philanthropist to get uncomfortable. What Dr. King said was we must address fundamental issues of power. And so I would submit that until in the boardrooms the family foundation offices of philanthropy in America, until we are talking about issues of power and saying that word, until we are saying the words white supremacy, as difficult and uncomfortable as it makes us, we will not see the material sustained progress because we will continue to engage in the performative acts and in the uh, token uh, interventions and in the iterative incrementalism that Dr. King again from the Birmingham jail challenged uh, his good meaning um, white uh, moderate friends uh, to challenge themselves about. Uh, until we're able to do that, philanthropy, philanthropy's impact on this issue of racial equity will not materialize into sustained change. Thank you. I want to bring in Yolanda. So your institute has trained over 1400 nonprofit leaders nationally with the skills and tools and networks for leading effective social change. So you have this really important nonprofit leadership perspective. What's the urgency that you're seeing in terms of how philanthropy has responded to this current moment? Thanks, Grace. I want to thank you and CAP as well for inviting me to be on this panel. It's really 
a gift to have these kinds of conversations with folks at such an important time. Um, you know, as I reflect on what Darren just talked about relative to shifting power, I would say for us, you know, that is the, the critical piece of work that we do um, on the nonprofit side to think about how to shift those structures within the, the field of nonprofit work. And philanthropy plays a key role in that. Um, and, you know, while philanthropy kind of quickly, many foundations and donors pivoted funding uh, towards racial justice and racial equity work as the racial reckoning erupted last spring, um, the, the urgency remains. And I think it is incumbent upon us to figure out how are we going to continue to make these kinds of investments and prioritize this work in the field um, as time passes. And so, you know, when I think about how the role that we play, it's really looking at, so if power sits in leadership, how do we support a change of leadership? How do we invest in leaders of color in racial equity work more broadly in the field? Funders are increasingly investing in these areas, naming them as priorities. Um, and those are obvious first steps in forwarding the work, but they're also looking to leaders for solutions more and more and funding more quickly with less restriction, which is so important. Um, and for our leaders, we know that for them to rise within the sector, that we have to fund the capacity building that organizations need to advance racial equity work and that they need to also fund opportunities for talent, BIPOC talent across all levels of organizations to access different capital that we, they need. And the way we kind of think about capital is in three types. There's knowledge capital, which is like access to information, education, thought leadership, new ideas, social capital, that's access to relationships, right? Financial capital isn't just building financial access to financial resources for organizations and also for leaders so that they can sustain themselves in the work. But it's also how do we help leaders get into positions of power and philanthropy and see themselves, see the pathway to actually being able to influence where money goes. Um, there are lots of programs out there like IMP who are doing this kind of work. And they've been doing it since our founding. So I suggest that for folks on, on this webinar to think about how do we amplify them? And if you're already funding this work and you already believe in it, awesome. Then further help your grantees expand their resources, right? Don't wait for a leader to ask you to make an introduction. Spot them, give them a platform, offer them introductions to your networks. And remember that organizations that are serving the majority of BIPOC communities they need you. And so it's not as simple as funding leaders of color either. It's also about funding organizations differently that are serving communities of color to shift power. So how do we help them develop actionable equity agendas and help them invest in that? Because we can't go this road alone. It's gonna take all of us, so. That's great. I'd love to circle back to that uh, nonprofit piece um, in a little bit. I also want to bring in Trisha to this conversation. Um, Trisha, the Riggs Foundation has been deep into an equity journey even before um, the pandemic and the events of last year. What did last year change for you all? Um, and I'd love to hear your perspective. Well, thanks very much for the question, Grace. And I join my colleagues. Um, I'm just humbled and honored to, to be a part of this conversation today. And I'm honestly still holding Micah's powerful words. Uh, that was a, an extraordinary um, experience for all of us. Uh, so um, I have to say, I'm, I am definitely grateful that Jeff and I were already several years into our racial equity learning when the pandemic hit, because it, it definitely helped us um, act faster when we needed to respond to many of the extraordinary events of 2020. You know, we already had an understanding of the uh, inequities that were baked into our system. Uh, so the disproportionate rate of uh, infection and death uh, in our communities of color from COVID, unfortunately, 
didn't really surprise, but we did make some shifts in our work. Um, like many other foundations, we quickly reached out to all of our core partners. Uh, we asked them what they needed in that moment, and that led to repurposing of grants for use in uh, general operations. Um, we also relaxed um, a lot of our expected outcomes and, and timelines. We also supported some specific organizations that were you know, responding in the moment uh, to issues uh, impacted by COVID. So we worked very closely with uh, our local uh, Seattle Community Foundation because we wanted to make sure that they were targeting the funds they were raising to those most in need and moving the dollars quickly. Now I'll give you a couple of examples of uh, specific uh, things that, uh, that we did because we work across youth systems. Um, we work on issues in our K through 12 education. We work on um, youth homelessness. We knew that when schools closed, students experiencing homelessness were gonna be hit very hard because schools happen to be that critical place where our young people experiencing homelessness find the stability, that sense of belonging. Oftentimes it's where they access food and hygiene. Uh, and we knew that there would be no federal or local emergency dollars funding um, that particular gap. So we worked quickly with one of our grantees, we brought other funders along and we were able to get funds distributed quickly and effectively across our state, focusing particularly in, um, in rural and indigenous populations because the young people leading our advising team knew where the greatest needs were because of their own lived experience and knowledge of the system. You know, our young people of color and our LGBTQ youth are disproportionately represented in our youth population. And so we had already built those strong relationships um, and we could lean on them in a crisis. So it really reinforced the importance of proximity um, in um, the work that we do at the foundation. And I would just add that the protests also really helped us fast track our thinking around power and the importance of shifting power. Mm -hmm. We stood up an exploratory fund called the Black Leadership and Power Fund. And um, it's different than any of our other foundation strategies, but we wanted to act quickly and we wanted to get in relationship uh, to really learn uh, what needed to be done. And we went about decision-making in a very different way. So those grants were directed by our black staff members to over a dozen organizations across sort of our three uh, C3 and C4 entities. And they were unrestricted funds that were really helping to elevate things like black leadership and bolstering black engagement in our democracy and leveraging community-based organizations to advance anti-racist uh, policy change. So from idea to execution, it was less than a two week timeline. So we're really realizing that, you know, true change, uh, true outcomes for our black indigenous and people of color in this country really requires helping to uh, build and shift power. So right now we're in the midst of a strategy development process. We are working as a full team on developing both a shared vision and a definition of power. We then hope to figure out what and how we will fund with that power analysis in mind. And uh, we're excited about it. It's new territory for us, but we are committed to learning uh, and to really getting it right. And this last year has been a significant uh, motivator to do that. That's great. I think this theme of power um, is one that's so important and there are many ways that it manifests in, in philanthropy in terms of who has the power and um, how the power flows. And I'd love to bring in last but not least in this conversation, Rashad. Rashad, your organization is often um, sort of the, the needling <laughs> that needs to happen with power, whether it's in Silicon Valley or Hollywood. And um, in a recent interview, you mentioned, um, this is a quote, we can't have charitable solutions to structural problems. You don't solve the Flint water crisis by just sending water bottles. You don't solve the crisis of inner city education uh, by doing mentorship and just service days. 
Um, those are ways to help, but those are not ways to undo the inequality. Um, what then from your perspective, given that you have worked across all these different industries, what is the role of philanthropy right now in your view? Thank you. And thank you for that. It's great to be here with my colleagues and great to be with all of you virtually. And I'm hoping that soon we'll be able to get back to uh, engagement um, in real life um, in all the ways um, that, that that helps to strengthen our work. But, you know, I think philanthropy's main role is one of understanding. Um, so many decisions flow from how we look at problems and how we're oriented to see them and understand the world and understanding the true needs. Um, you know, for instance, um, understanding that change is not bought, but change is grown. Um, an example is like, if you're setting the stage for a photo shoot, you set up a bunch of plastic plants, you take the picture and then you walk away. In the photo, you can't tell the difference. But if you want a garden, uh, you need that garden to produce substance, substance for years and to feed and to be a, a sort of a visible and clear. And that's the same thing when it comes to movement building. I remember uh, one of my first jobs in high school was working at the Brooks Brothers at the, at the outlet mall in my community on Eastern Long Island. And you know, we could put displays in the windows where we pinned the suits in the back so that they looked a certain way out front, but they didn't actually fit the sort of person that way when they came into the stores. And people would look at the display and think that that's how it might look on them. And that's not actually how it works. Mm -hmm. um, understanding that equity in media, for instance, isn't about getting more airtime um, or more Facebook pages. It's about media ownership. Black people, for instance, um, not always being the guest on someone else's dinner party, but having our own. You know, yes, Black Twitter is great, but Black Twitter against Fox News or Facebook is not a fair fight. And that's not just because of the difference in resources. Black Twitter is organizing. Fox News and Facebook are infrastructure. We need both savvy and wide reaching organizing and also the kind of infrastructure that builds the kind of power you can only build and sustain with major investments in long-term uh, capability that establishes an audience that is consistent and creates a direct connection of trust that can move millions, uh, hundreds of thousands, or whatever sort of necessary to sort of drive engagement and winning. When philanthropy moves from thinking about helping us buy time in media to helping us buy media platforms itself, we're moving in the right direction to thinking sort of about power. Another way that we talk about it at Color of Change is understanding the difference between presence and power. Presence is visibility, awareness, retweets, shout outs from the stage, Power is the ability to change the rules. And sometimes when we mistake presence for power, we can think that we've done something that we haven't actually done. We can think that a black president, which is really good, is actually changed the rules and made us post-racial. We can think that the celebration of black celebrity means that America loves black people as much as America loves black um, culture. And America can love, celebrate, and monetize black culture and not like black people very much at the same time. And those two things don't have to really be in conflict. And so understanding is incredibly key for anyone that's going into the space of helping to make decisions that will be force multipliers in terms of who gets to move an agenda and who doesn't, how those issues. And when I talk about sort of the difference between charitable solutions um, versus uh, structural change, for those of us who are doing this work, whether we're in philanthropy or in the field, it also just starts off by how we even talk about the problem. And I will say, I share a couple of quick things on this and then be quiet. Um, far too often, we will talk about black communities as vulnerable. Vulnerability is a personal trait. I can sometimes be vulnerable. I don't know if I go on social media and see an ex-boyfriend that's way too happy with his life. That's my personal thing. I need to deal with that. But Black communities are not vulnerable. We've been targeted, attacked, exploited. When you call communities that have been targeted, attacked, exploited, vulnerable, people spend their time thinking about how to fix them, right? Charitable solutions, rather than working to fix the structure, right? It's the difference between saying Black people are less likely to get a loan from the bank 
instead of saying banks are less likely to give loans to Black people. They may sound the same, but on one hand, we end up with financial literacy programs for Black people to help Black folks do better with banks that from their very beginning have targeted, exploited, redlined, and kept us out versus actually dealing with structural change at the banks. You can think about it in terms of every single system when we talk about sort of Black people, oftentimes focusing the onus on fixing Black people, Black families, Black communities, rather than fixing the structures and the systems that have stood in the way of change. So once again, understanding then from an operations perspective has to lead to not just sort of funding programs, but funding infrastructure because that builds power and saying what we actually mean so that we actually lead ourselves towards the solutions that can be sort of the drivers of change that is lasting, not change that is about uh, charity. Hmm. That's, that's really powerful. Um, I think, you know, I think of, I had a recent conversation where that last point you made was really brought home to me that, you know, when we say that, um, you know, black communities and other communities of color were disproportionately affected by COVID, to your point, no, actually, it's that COVID affects everybody, but that they have been, you know, disproportionately, um, they have not had the systems and the protection that other groups have had over time and therefore COVID, um, is impacting them in a different way. And, and that language is important. Um, Grace, can I just say on this point, yes. I think philanthropy has been organized to solve social problems. And just following on Rashad's brilliant explication here, I think philanthropy needs therefore to change from a problem diagnosis to an understanding of power and systems and structures. And this is why the work around white supremacy, around understanding how our systems and structures have been designed and how we have learned to understand what problems are in society. I'm fascinated when I look back in the archives of the Ford Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation and see reports from the 1960s entitled The Negro Problem. And so this The Negro Problem was a study of ghettos and the problem with Negroes in these ghettos, as opposed to studying how did these ghettos come to be? How did we come to see Negroes as the problem. And I think we have to excavate our language and our understanding. And I think that quite candidly has to be led by white philanthropists, which is why I'm so grateful to courageous philanthropists like the Rakes, who are willing to talk about white supremacy as a reality and not some figment of me and Rashad and Yolanda's imagination. I mean, but that that is, it is actually real that the institutions in our society were actually not designed for us. And this isn't an indictment of individuals. And that's why sometimes the conversation becomes difficult with philanthropists because people feel that it is a personal attack. You're calling me a white supremacist. No, we're not calling you a white supremacist. You are trying to do good works, good philanthropy in a system that is white supremacist. And until you recognize that that's the system, you will be spinning your wheels doing these incremental things because and feeling like you're not having impact feeling that your programmatic interventions and your philanthropic investments have been wasted, when in fact they've not been wasted, but they are fighting against a system that needs itself to be dismantled. And the work of philanthropy needs to be in dismantling those systems and building the kinds of systems where equality is actually built in. What would your advice be, Darren and others? I mean, I imagine that there are some funders on this call for whom, you know, the dichotomy you, you mentioned, Rashad, of like presence versus power. 
I mean, we're still wrestling with presence here, right? And like maybe that last year, the events was the first time that there was like a real personal or maybe even organizational reckoning around white supremacy. Where does one go to learn more about these structures and to see the problem more clearly? I mean, I think that there's a lot of places. One, I would say um, the, the work that is happening in communities that are winning on these issues is actually the first place to start, right? You know, one thing that I think uh, we should be proud of, right, in terms of the infrastructure that has been funded over the last several years, and I can't see folks' faces, but I know that many folks were involved in this, is that, you know, in the, um, you know, there was this one moment over the summer where I reached out to my dear sister Patrice Cullors, one of the co-founders of the Black Lives Matter movement in Los Angeles. I saw some of the police interaction that was happening on the ground in Los Angeles and reached out to her to see how she was doing, how others were doing, if there's anything that we could do, me being, you know, thousands of miles away. Um, but if there was ways that we could amplify, push on media, what have you. And she reminded me about the last seven years of organizing leadership development, folks having to learn to work together, like what we have built together, a point at which uh, it was racist to say Black Lives Matter and now it's being raised on flags and put on streets and the power that racial justice has as a persuasion vehicle. Sometimes we talk about racial justice as the moral thing to do, and it is. Sometimes we talk about it as the charitable thing to do, and it is, but it's also the strategic thing to do. Think about this summer when many of us thought that the best we could do in terms of activism was uplift powerful investigative journalism or clap outside of our windows for the essential workers that were getting us through. It was racial justice that powered people into the streets. It was racial justice that led to the spike in voter registration, particularly among young people. Racial justice became a majoritarian issue this summer. Now the opportunity is to translate that into a governing majority, but that gives us the ability to win on healthcare, to win on climate, to win on education. If you care about sort of a whole range of issues, you've got to think about the ways in which racial injustice has impacted our ability to win and not think about racial justice as a deficit, but actually think about it as our most powerful motivating force. It's the force mm -hmm that actually motivated multiracial communities to stand up, right? If racial justice is now a majoritarian issue in polling and black people are not the majority, that means that we have persuaded a lot of other people to stand with us. And that is powerful in terms of what does it take to win? And so as I think about what is it gonna take to get a true democracy, it's not that it'll produce racial justice, it's that racial justice is our path to getting there. And we should be thinking about how to leverage it, how to unleash it, and not think about um, in the final quarter of any game, you don't bench your best player. And I believe racial justice is our best player. And for folks that want to learn more and get involved more, there are movements working. And as philanthropists, the thing I would say, just on behalf of those of us who do the work um, and are running organizations, that if you want to do learning, that you've got to find ways to do that in ways that are uh, fair and equitable and responsible to the folks on the ground doing the work. Um, you know, Color of Change is a much bigger infrastructure than many of my other brothers and sisters doing this work. Um, but even we can be in a strain with all the folks wanting to come and learn sometimes. And at the end of the day, our responsibility to keep winning has to be to the work. Yeah, folks should also be compensating for, uh, people that they are asking advice for in this process. Trisha, um, I'm curious if you could share a little bit more about your journey, like how you learned more about these structures. And I know that you and Jeff also have a voice among um, communities of donors who may be predominantly white. And how do you bring people along when they're just seeing the problem for the first time and may not you know, see it with the breadth and the depth of others um, on this panel? Great question, Grace. Maybe I'll maybe I'll just step back a moment and share a little bit about how Jeff and I got started. Um, you know, we've always been drawn to work on hard problems. Um, you know, how we can really help bring enduring change and try to, you know, address root cause. And you know, in our case, we've been very drawn to systems that uh, serve our young people. But 
uh, as you can imagine, you know, uh, all best efforts and good intentions, our work was clearly uh, incomplete. And over the last five, six years, um, we've really come to understand more deeply the role of racism uh, and the, uh, the way it plays out in the lives of Black Americans and people of color across our country. You know, it is, as, as uh, my esteemed colleagues have mentioned, it is just built into so much of how our country operates. There was an interesting piece I read recently that described racism like smog, that um, we don't often see it and we don't think about it because it's everywhere. And when I talk about the we, I mean people like Jeff and I and, and other white people because we don't experience it in the same way. And so I think um, the words of Isabel um, Wilkerson still stick with me. She wrote that our caste system based on race is very much the infrastructure of our divisions. So as Rashad said, you know, uh, race is absolutely, focusing on race is absolutely the right thing to do. But we also recognize that we won't achieve the um, aspirations that we have for, uh, for our work uh, if we don't understand the critical role that race plays in our history uh, and in our current moment. So it's been quite a journey for Jeff and I over the last number of years, but I can tell you we are fully in uh, and we are here for the long haul. You know, one of the um, quotes I was uh, quite inspired by, uh, by from in one of Ibram Kendi's books was that it's important to to know our past and when we know our past, we will know our present. And so Jeff and I are very committed to doing the work, to educating ourselves on the history of our country. Uh, but as we have learned along the way, we've also realized that um, our privilege has affected how we define the problems and the solutions. Mm -hmm. It's impacted, um, you know, how, who we surround ourselves with. And early on, um, most of those individuals were white people. So we've done a lot of reading. We've engaged with a lot of colleagues and community leaders. We've also hired DEI consultants to work with our teams, but also to work with each of us individually. Um, so where has that gotten us? Well, we've um, clearly diversified our team. We've also changed our operating values. Uh, we have spent a lot more time in conversation with our BIPOC uh, leaders in our community. And we've listened to our young people who share their experiences because they are so familiar with the systems uh, that they experience. So uh, we have now made sure that um, those young people are sitting at all the right tables uh, when decisions are being made uh, that will impact them. And we know along the way that um, that we have gained a, a lot of valuable insights from shifting the way uh, we show up and it's really improved uh, our work to date. So from my experience, philanthropy would benefit from decentralizing its own expertise and mm -hmm. listening more to people um, who know what it's like to navigate these broken systems. Because I think when we do, and then we invest, um, in what they see needs to be fixed, um, I think we'll, we'll make greater progress. So when I think about sort of specific advice to some of my colleagues in philanthropy, um, there's certainly a lot of great resources and lists. We have a curated list on the Rakes Foundation site, but um, I would like to actually point to one particular article that I found um, inspiring and, and both Jeff and I refer to it, and that is the uh, the article called The Curb Cut Effect that was published years ago in the Stanford um, Social Innovation Review. It illuminates the concept of targeted universalism, which is if you really want to fix a system, and it could be transportation, it could be education, it could be policing, you have to start by talking to those who are most impacted or who are least well served by the systems. Because it turns out, if you listen, um, and then you design the changes in the system to meet their needs, then everyone will likely benefit. And so um, I think philanthropists looking for high leverage solutions, um, that's a really important place to start is to understand um, the targeted universalism concept. 
And I guess lastly, I would just incur, uh, I would encourage any of the, um, the white folks that are listening to this conversation today to really stick with the work. You know, our learning and evolution, um, it's not been easy. We've had a lot of really tough conversations in our foundation, but um, we are super clear now that there is no neutral in this work. You are either working to dismantle these systems and structures or you are allowing the status quo to continue. So I'd really like to invite some of my white colleagues that are not already engaged in this work uh, to really join us in the work. Thank you. Grace, can I just before going to Yolanda, because yes. I want to say something that I hope sure. Yolanda will agree with. And that is something that Tricia just said about how we invest, how we philanthropists invest. I believe if you believe in racial equity, you will not do what too many foundations and donors do, which is project support to death nonprofits. And mm -hmm the ways, the pernicious ways in which project support and the under-resourcing of the infrastructure investments hits small, hits uh, minority-led, uh, people of color-led organizations is profound. And it is a reason in part why the capacity that Yolanda spoke of in, in the uh, BIPOC community is often so fragile because it has been underinvested in as institutions because we know that institutions are what sustain change and what donors get excited by is the social uh, entrepreneur of the day or the silver new shiny object that's all important we need innovation we need ingenuity but we need institutions in these communities to support and to be the ladders for leadership development so that we will see more people of color led organizations when those organizations are sufficiently resourced. So from an equity standpoint, this too will require donors to get uncomfortable and to move out of the normative ways in which we center ourselves. My own organization is as guilty of this as any, and, and it's been something we have been tackling. We've through a number of interventions, you know, when I became president, we were 21% general operating support. As of last fiscal year, we were over 80% general operating support. Um, and and we, we should be, I mean, because ultimately the work that we are working on, it's institutions, it's, it's the legal defense fund. When people say, why have you funded the legal defense fund for 45, well, in 1964, we were funding the NAACP Legal Defense Fund to sue the states of Alabama, Georgia, and Louisiana for voter suppression. Guess what? Last year, we made a large grant to the Legal Defense Fund to sue the states of Louisiana, Alabama, and Georgia for voter suppression. Those institutions, if, if our aspiration is to be a multiracial, a vibrant multiracial democracy, then we have to understand that democracy will be contested because as we become multiracial in a system that has been designed through the gaze of white supremacy, the more democracy looks like America, the more it will become contested, which is why what we have seen in recent weeks when people say what democracy looks like can't be what just happened in Georgia. Democracy will be rigged if you're counting the votes in Philadelphia and Milwaukee and Detroit. There's gotta be something wrong. Democracy is actually not working if those votes are being counted. And what I think the philanthropist has to say is we want everyone's vote to be counted. But that idea, which is a nonpartisan idea, that idea will be contested as we become a more vibrant multicultural, multiracial democracy. That's great. I think um, it, your comment makes me think about, um, CP had a report a couple months ago, um, in part funded by the Ford Foundation, around how there really isn't a good reason why funders are not giving more general operating support. Like yes, there is. Oh, Grace, yes, there is. <laughs> the, the reason is power. 
control. Yes. Come on. We're, I mean, yes. we can't be beaten around the frame. It's about power. It's about control. It's about being able to say, my input got this outcome. And that's what I care about. As opposed to saying, if we want to solve this challenge, here are the five key institutions we need to be resourcing to achieve those objectives and let them decide they are better positioned to know what the right strategy, the right outcome ought to be for their community. So let's not pretend, Grace, that we can't figure out why. Uh, yes. It's about power. Yeah, it seems like the seeding of power is sort of like the, the core, the hardest last nut to crack because it is in essence stepping out of the center of, of the conversation. I, I'm wondering, Yolanda, you're, working with a range of nonprofit leaders. And some folks may say, well, you know what? My work as a funder or as a nonprofit leader actually doesn't touch upon racial equity as much because um, you know, I work on climate change or animal welfare. What, what do you say to them? I mean, what's the opportunity for funders to support nonprofits regardless of whether it's a specific focus of their work? Thanks for that question. Just if I could back up for a moment, I had yeah. the gift of a couple hours ago interviewing Professor Ibram X. Kendi. And he spoke, Darren, I think, you know, you summed up so much of what we talked about in that conversation. And he talked specifically about how racial progress is always followed by racist progress. And so that systems and structures become more sophisticated in response. And so we see white supremacy uh, evolve uh, to because it's threatened. And, and where I think there's the opportunity and we're seeing it right here in this room is looking at representation and leadership. And why? Because these conversations, there aren't a lot of people like Trisha who start there. And we're grateful, so grateful for Trisha and other philanthropists on this call who are pushing this work despite the fact that they may not have lived experience with oppression, marginalization, structural racism. Because like I said before, like I'm, I'm not eager to have a divide. I'm eager to push social progress, right? But if we don't have representation, leadership, we can't meaningfully invest in, advance it. We can't advance racial equity if you don't know what you don't know. And so uh, in that way, it's when, when I think about no matter what you're investing in or what a leader is leading, like you said, climate change, animal welfare, education, the, the root cause always, when you study it, the root cause for these issues and the way that they, they impact communities is structural racism. You can't escape it. And, and so the more you kind of immerse yourself in that understanding, I think what comes to light is the opportunity. If we advance racial equity, everything advances for all of us. And the people who need to be at the table are representative of all of us. And that hasn't been the case to date. And so I think as you know, we talk about um, the kinds of investments that need to happen. It's general operating, it's capacity building, it's pushing on organizations to change their structures to Rashad's point about just infrastructure needs to change. So how do we help people navigate that process? Because it, it, it's complex, they may not know where to start, but a lot of people know where to start. And so there are ways to invest in those efforts and also for nonprofits to, to advance those efforts. You know, and I, and I would say just generally, we know the research shows that these are the areas where funding is majorly lacking. And um, part of it is because you can't see or feel it. You know, it's, it's big, it's abstract, but it's like if we don't go upstream and tackle the big issue, then the programmatic investments at the ground level are, are, aren't going to get us where, where we want to go. Um, and you know, the last thing I'll say, I've been thinking about this a lot lately because you know, there's a, a lot of work around 
um, understanding the effects of capitalism relative to, to racial equity, obviously. And I think the reality is we're, we're not going to um, move away from capitalism anytime soon. And so I think we have to look at how to leverage the context we're in so that, and there's nobody better to do that than a lot of folks in this room who have access to capital to think about how we value what we pay for. If we focus on efforts like community organizing, political action, advancing leaders of color, organizational effectiveness around racial equity strategies, then we will build the difference we wanna see. And I, I think moving away from this focus on, we're gonna to try to shift beliefs as if, you know, there's a, a lot of times I think people, and, and I may come under fire for this, so I apologize for everyone who loves implicit bias training and other trainings. I think they're so important. And implicit bias training isn't gonna get us where we wanna go, right? If we wait for beliefs to change and instead of making the changes and watching beliefs shift, then we're not gonna get anywhere. The context needs to change for beliefs to change. I don't know if you've ever tried to change somebody's beliefs from when their cultural upbringing, it's not easy, it takes time. And I'm just not interested anymore in risking the lives of more black and brown people to change hearts and minds. And so we have effective strategies to advance this. And I think we can put the money there and really change the game. I really do. That's great. I want to stay on this thread and actually transition to Q&A because I think a lot of the questions that we're getting are specifically on this topic. So, I mean, I'm going to summarize a couple of them and I'm going to throw them out and any of the panelists can respond. There's a bunch of questions about how we push this conversation. Um, how do we dismantle these systems? Or if we're people of color within philanthropy, uh, how do we push without losing our jobs um, or, or really being viewed as divisive? And I'm wondering um, if the panelists have any advice for folks who are really trying to live out these values, but institutionally run into a whole bunch of barriers, what would you say to them? Well, I think that it's very difficult for, um, for philanthropists to engage because our complicity, uh, we're implicated and people take this very personally. And I think it's, we, we, those of us who are seeking to, um, to engage have to understand that and approach these conversations with some degree of empathy around that, right? I mean, that, that for many, I mean, I had a, 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 a very wealthy white woman who genuinely said to me, you know, when I, I knew that we had a problem in, of racism, but when I, I actually watched the George Floyd video like multiple times and I cried more each time, it broke my heart. And it broke her heart and she was crying because she was crying for America. She was crying for a belief that she had grown up with that opportunity was abound in, in this country. And that actually, while there was racism, it wasn't systemic. It wasn't embedded in the way in which I talked about it. And so she was crying. The grief was genuine. And the grief was because it took that for her to actually see that this is real. And it is systemic. And, mm -hmm. and so when we talk about how we convince people, we have to understand that for some people, again, not all people, but for some people, um, this is very, very painful conversation because they are rich, they are successful, they are wealthy in part because this very system has worked for them has created their wealth. And now you want to have a conversation with them where they can talk easily uh, about, about a system that has benefited them. And so we have to understand that and have some degree of empathy, some degree of an ability to put ourselves in the other person's shoes. Now, on the other hand, you know, I said in a in a, in a board uh, room, what you know, a couple of years ago, I, I was the only African American, which sadly is not unusual. 
white supremacy and the problem. And someone after the meeting said to me, Darren, you shouldn't use that term. It's a real turnoff. And if you want white people to engage, don't talk about white supremacy, talk, figure out another way to talk about it. And I said, I have been trying to figure out how to talk about this without saying white supremacy. Uh, I, I cannot, you know, I've tried prejudice. I've tried bias. I've tr I mean, I'm, I've thought about a lot. I, I, I don't know what else to call this because it was designed with one thing in mind. And so I don't know what, please help me find another word if, if it'll help white people be engaged. But I, I have been unable to find a term uh, or word for that term. You know, Grace, one of the things that I wanted to, um, to share is I do think oftentimes um, this work is um, sort of viewed as the responsibility of the staff bringing it forward um, with the principals. And, um, and often it's the staff of color uh, that is expected to sort of prioritize equity within an organization. And you know, ideally the responsibility would be with people like me, you know, the trustees um, and the foundation leaders. But unfortunately, um, I know that that's not the reality yet. Uh, and it's not the reality in most organizations and I have to say, it was certainly not the reality uh, for us. And I think sometimes um, there is sort of a moment, a jolt that really initiates uh, a lot of this work to, to Darren's point about the woman that was really moved by, uh, by watching, um, watching media. But for us, uh, it came in 2015. We had at the time only one black staff member and she came in to work the day after nine people were murdered attending the Bible study at the Emanuel African Methodist Church in Charleston, South Carolina. And no one in our office had said a word about it. And she, you know, she thought to herself, we're supposed to be an organization that cares about equity. Um, and yet this mostly white team at the time, um, nobody said anything. So it was very powerful and hurtful uh, for her, but I think, you know, the truth is that was our moment when we realized we were not doing the work. And so it was quite painful, uh, the months that ensued, but I think oftentimes it is an incident that starts us onto, uh, onto the path. And that was certainly the case for us. And so that led us to, to training and then to diversifying our team. And we know that, uh, that our work is much better for it. But I guess part of my advice to folks that are listening that are CEOs and executive directors, I would say don't shield your trustees uh, from these kinds of conversations. I think it's really important to help connect them to peers like Jeff and me um, or donor networks that are actively engaged in the learning because Jeff and I were unaware of what was happening uh, on our team at the time until much later. And we certainly wished we hadn't been left in the dark. Um, so we are now very committed to learning alongside each other. Um, and I think uh, oftentimes in white dominant organizations, you know, leaders with even best intentions um, will have their blind spots and they won't know how to really uh, enter into that work. So uh, bringing on the professional support, I think will be, um, really important to do and to really encourage those conversations internally because if we can get the right leaders to model that work, we will be able to create those spaces um, to, to all be on the right journey together. Thank you for your openness with that, Trisha. I think that's just so helpful to know about your own kind of the inflection points. I'm seeing a bunch of questions that I'm, I'm going to also amalgamate. You know, Darren, and you said this, um, in a previous comment, and, and this really is a question for, for anyone, I think that there can be this perceived tension between seeding power, but then the idea that as funders, we have a role of stewardship, right? Or that there's an evaluative component to what we have to do. And you know, the idea of general operating support where you find the organizations that you trust and you fund them deeply can sort of rub against this feeling of like being able to track every nickel and dime to be able to tell the trustees like this is the this is the impact that we're making. 
can you address this tension? Because I think that it's sort of, a, again, at the core of some of the, I think some of the things that people are feeling inside is that like, yes, I would like to, you know, just give without strings, but like, what about, what about, what about, right? And so could you, some, you know, any of you- I, I'm ask, happy to, to jump in here, Grace, because I yeah. think uh, the, first of all, this begins with leadership and it is the role in a legacy foundation like, like Ford, uh, or with a living donor, um, an executive director, someone to be able to uh, to articulate a vision. And, and so when I became president of Ford, my job was to articulate a vision that's, that said, we are putting institutions at the center. If we have an aspiration for a multiracial democracy to strengthen democracy as Henry Ford said, he didn't say multiracial democracy, he said democracy, but the issue for it to be stronger is for it to be multiracial. And so if we want that to happen, how does change happen? And what we know over our 80 years is that it is institutions who sustain change. Yes, we gave a grant to help Dr. King with that project or Gloria Steinem with that project, but it was those grants to the Southern Christian leadership, to SCLC. It was the grants to Gloria for the Ms. Foundation. It was the grants to Muhammad Yunus to build the Grameen Bank. Those were the signatures. And so if we know that from evaluation, then we understand that institutions are at the center. I reject the idea that by investing with general operating support, you're doing non-evaluative work. You can evaluate institutions and their resilience and their durability as a result of your general operating support. There are indicators of that. Color of Change is a recipient of large general operating support. We are able by looking and monitoring and receiving information about the color of changes work annually and how that aligns with its own work plan and progress to know. We also have indicators of looking at things like infrastructure, board development, all these things are metricable. And so when donors say, oh, I wanna be able to measure, I, I reject that there is something less rigorous and it is not, with no strings attached. No one gives money to a nonprofit with no strings attached. And no nonprofit wants the money with no strings attached. Leaders like Rashad wanna be, want to be accountable. Yolanda wants to be accountable. She's not saying give me the money, no strings attached. And so I think we have work to do in philanthropy to change the mindset that has people thinking that this is overhead or I won't support overhead. Well, if you want support overhead, you are not likely to have impact. And I just think that having that real conversation with donors um, is, is just hugely important. And the last thing I'll say is part of the reason here is the tyranny of the word strategy and the mm -hmm. harm that has been done by a series of articles that were written by mostly consultants and consulting firms that laid out this new idea of strategy. And so strategy now has become tyrannical. It has become so overpowering and has so crowded out the intangibles, which are often the most important part of your input and the most important part of the work that these organizations do in community. It is, it is done and it has put philanthropy at the center and so that's the problem with strategy. It puts us at the center and it turns our grantees into contractors. And so we need more than contracting partners because they actually know more about the problem and are more proximate to the challenge than we are. We just, um, we just ended up with this great story in entertainment trade about the work we're doing in Hollywood writers. Particularly we've been in about 35 since the uprising, the crime for crime type procedural shows, also getting the TV show Cops and, and live TV off the air. But let me just say this, just to add to what Darren was saying, was that uh, several years ago, um, when we presented this plan of expanding into cultural space, we got some support from a set of foundations that trusted 
us to go in this direction. And we started engaging. And then we hit some walls around sort of getting into those writers' rooms. And so then we went and we got, and we took some of those resources and we worked with the Norman Lear School at USC and did a big seminal study of all the crime TV shows. It came out last January and we got some good stories and we got a little bit more attention. And then we were in a couple of more writers' rooms. And then basically what ended up happening was we had got, built this relationship with the Writers Guild. And somehow we had a, we had a scheduled presentation with, for writers about this presentation where I was gonna walk through it with about 15 writers that had signed up. This was scheduled two weeks after George Floyd was murdered. It ended up from about 15 writers to about 100 writers, producers who ended up showing to this Zoom call where I walked through the study. I walked through what the, I would walk through the narratives. I walked through all the ways in which race and crime was misrepresented. We had the report because people trusted us to make decisions. We had been inside of the writers' rooms and had learned from our mistakes. We kept moving along the way. Now we actually have a whole set of shows which have redesigned their whole next season around showing the role of injustice in communities, showing the structures that actually lead to um, racist policing, showing the ways in which young people get trapped in a criminal justice system. You, if that would have happened and then a foundation would have had an idea, it would have taken us two years, right? But because folks trusted us to have ideas, to go through the track record, we're gonna end up with a whole bunch of narrative um, projects that are gonna reach millions of people in their homes better than any PSA or op-ed we could mm -hmm. write that would have never happened if it was not for general operating support, would have never, that if I had put in a grant proposal in the beginning, I'm gonna be in 30 writer's rooms with you know, a report, people would have laughed at me or I would have not ever put it because I would have never wanted to be held to that standard. But when the moment hit, we were able to prepare. And so this is also about um, the ways in which we win. How do we want to win? And if we truly believe we can win, we actually have to be able to invest in ways that can allow things to become force multipliers. And right now, um, you know, we have the ability to deal with the fact that for the last 20 years in this country, violent crime has basically steadily went down. But according to Pew Research and everywhere else, Americans believe that violent crime is going up. There's a gap between perception and reality. And we, along with other organizations, along with research partners, are able to have the infrastructure to address this gap between perception and reality, which can do so much to the policy work and so much else. That doesn't happen without general operating support, doesn't happen without trust. And absolutely, we're gonna be evaluated on this in the end, and we want to be evaluated. I wanna sing this story and sing this song and hope that it leads to other types of support. So we try other things, some which will be great, some which will fail, but that actually has to be part of the story. That's a really, really powerful comparison and story to stay in our minds. Um, we're nearing the very end of our time. And I, I just want to give each panelist, I mean, I think that I've heard this said on Twitter and in other places, boy, there's just a lot of talk about philanthropy and racial equity. It's time to, it's time to act. Like why, why are we not acting? And I guess I would have wanted to give each of you 30 seconds just to exhort the field. Like what is your, what would you like to leave with us? Um, the sort of the nugget um, as we as we depart today. Yolanda, I'll start with you. I would, that's exactly actually what I was thinking about relative to the final nugget is act while you learn and invest in the action and the learning for yourself and also for others. There's just no time to lose and there are pathways to do it. We've heard some of them today. So I hope people will join in and if there are ways any of us can help share ideas, people will know how to find us. Thank you. Trisha? Oh boy, a, a few seconds. Um, you know, I would just say this work has honestly changed me. It's changed the way I see the world. It has changed how I want to show up. And so for me, it's kind of holding myself accountable. It's um, being bold to enter into conversations with some of my peers and to, uh, as we start having these conversations, uh, to sort of push and nudge um, and to really help them 
you know, enter, enter into this space um, and, to, uh, and to stick with the work. Because I think, uh, as we said earlier and Rashad said, it's, uh, it is the right thing, but it's also the smart thing to do when we wanna make the kind of progress that we wanna make uh, in this country. And so I just don't see any other option than to, uh, to move forward and to bring others along. Thank you. Rashad? I mean, I just think that the world's going to look different 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. And I just ask all of us to like maybe close our eyes. And if we're looking at the movie 20 years from now of this moment, what character do we want to be in that story? Who, what's the archetype? What did we want to contribute? What do we want to be able to tell the people uh, that are writing the story of our contributions in this moment? And I think all of us have an opportunity and are privileged by just by being on this call because of the positions you're in to actually have a role in shaping the future. And I think that that is the opportunity. And just, I really appreciate Tricia adding that racial justice right is strategy. It is the smart thing to do. It is the winning framework. Thanks. And Darren? Well, I would just say that we are moving into a different world. We lived in a BC world until recently, a before COVID world. Soon we will be living in a post COVID world. The BC world is over. We are never going back to that world. So the question is, what will the PC world, what will the post COVID world look like? And what will philanthropy do to ensure that the negative things that we saw in the BC world, the discrimination, the bias, the prejudice, uh, that that is eradicated, that that is in fact not a feature of our world. There is work, urgent work for philanthropy to do to achieve racial equity and racial justice. And now is the time. Thank you so much. Um, with that, I'm going to close today. Um, I'm going to share very quickly just a couple more things before I let everyone go. Um, I want to say a huge thank you to everyone for, for joining us, um, especially our panelists. Um, you have brought so many important ideas um, to our audience, and we're very, very grateful to you. Um, for our attendees, um, you should have received uh, a, a survey in your inbox already. And we'd love to get your feedback on this event. Um, we're always trying to do better and we're so grateful that you joined us today. I wanted to announce that our next learning series event is going to be on April 29th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. And it's about, are we better off divided? Philanthropy's role in our current moment. We have the full lineup at this link, which is case sensitive. And we hope that you'll take the time to register today and join us for another really great conversation. And then finally, I just wanted to thank our sponsors again for making this event possible and for supporting CP's ongoing work. The Walton Family Foundation, Archstone Foundation, the Elmina B. Seawall Foundation, the Jacob and Valeria Langeloth Foundation, and the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation. Thank you so much again to everyone. Um, we'll see you soon. <laughs>